This is a talk that I gave about a year and a half ago. I gave it to a room of about 20 senior engineers, with one of them being our principal engineer. And about three quarters of the way through, I heard a strange sound, and the principal engineer had gone to sleep. So, so this uh, either says a couple of things. One, my presentation style is uh, not optimal, or secondly, that the material is extremely dry, which I personally think it is. Like it's heavy technical detail. I really apologize. Anyone who's not become super technical, I deeply, deeply apologize. But words are cheap. So um, if you really need, I've brought donuts. And, 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 so, so if, you, if, if you're really about to pass out, like, um, just Sugar. grab, I don't, I don't, you know, it's he's, not a, He's uh, just buying from Yo, this is, <laughs> this is so so bribery. I have no shame. I have no shame when it comes to this. So, um, yeah, so even if you do fall, even if it is a rough experience, hopefully it's not a total loss. So Oracle, um, uh, Oracle's stance uh, is that, uh, oh by the way, um, I only got about three and a half hours of sleep because I drank Turkish coffee last night at a silly hour, so I'm going to also be reading off the slides a little bit today. Um, so Oracle's approach is that maximum reliance on immutable objects is widely accepted as a sound strategy. Um, uh, my personal approach before we kind of get into uh, immutability inside of JavaScript and the immutable JS library itself is that when I'm working on non-trivial code bases, I love to have a combination of both immutable JS and TypeScript. I think they both perform uh, uh, very important functions and they lead to um, a more maintainable code base. Um, just off the top, before we jump into that, which is a giant can of worms and Lots of people have opinions, um, but that's just my two cents. So, how do we define immutability? Uh, so, in object oriented, just again reading off the slides, uh, spoiler alert. In object oriented and functional programming, an immutable object is an object whose state cannot be modified after it is created. So, um, this slide should be been before. So what we want to achieve in this uh, training for today, like understanding our, the general idea of immutability, is firstly, we want to understand how JavaScript deals with mutability and immutability, to understand why we can't just use vanilla JS to truly implement immutability. Um, we want to discuss the, the, the benefits of uh, implementing immutability in our code bases. And lastly, we want to acquire a basic understanding of uh, the usage of the immutable.js library. Um, so that's our, our bird's eye view. I'm, not, I'm going to try not to go too deep into immutable.js itself um, because, you know, again, in a tech talk, I, I, as I was discussing, uh, the goal isn't to like, see every possible method, it's uh, to get the general idea. So firstly, we want to discuss how does JavaScript actually deal with mutability and immutability. Say, for instance, we have a username, and the username is Ben, right? So we've, we've defined it in our first line. We can then go ahead and change that to uh, Charles, and that means that the value of username will actually change. We're going to discuss kind of what happens under the hood as well as far as memory allocation. This is an example of an immutable object. So we're actually using a const instead of a let, and that means const stands for constant. Um, and when we try and, uh, uh, how do you say, change the value of username to Charles, we get thrown an error. So we can't actually change that value without throwing an error. So we first need to understand how JavaScript actually uh, deals with this before we can deal with immutable. Um, in JavaScript, only ar uh, objects and arrays are mutable, uh, not primitive values. For instance, strings and numbers. And here when we are discussing uh, mutability at this stage, we're not discussing uh, the value, we're actually discussing um, its place in memory. So uh, for a string and, and a number, when you reassign a value to them, uh, it doesn't actually change uh, the value of, that, uh, of the initial place in memory. So for instance here, imagine we, we have just a, a variable, let a is equals hello, and we're just going to add on the string world to it. So kind of like what's happening under the hood here? Um, we take the, the, when we uh, take a, 
the existing value of A is retrieved from memory, world is appended to that existing value of A, right? And then that resultant uh, uh, value, which is hello world, is now allocated to a new block of memory, um, and that A object, so A now points to the newly created memory space, and the previously created memory space, so what A was up here, is now available for garbage collection. That's what's uh, happening underneath the hood. Uh, by the way, just a, a quick aside before I jump into anything else. Um, I'm going to put out a link to the slides uh, after this. And for a lot of um, uh, these slides, you can see down here in the bottom right hand corner, there's a link. And that's actually where uh, all these things that I'm kind of talking about comes from. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see here, but it's just down here. And you can go and actually check out the, the source of, of, uh, of these statements. So here we have um, a, a native objects in JavaScript are mutable. So objects, arrays, functions, classes, sets, and maps. The primitive data types, which is strings, numbers, booleans, nulls, undefines, and symbols, are immutable. And this is regarding their space in memory, not their value. So if you still use a let on these and then uh, update the value, it's still going to it'll it'll reassign the value. Uh, but it, uh, it'll be in a new place in memory, whereas here, it's the existing space in memory uh, gets modified. So you're all thinking about reaching for a donut now, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> all right, pop quiz, what does symbol do? Anyone symbol in JavaScript? I, I, so basically, I was, as I was going through the, uh, the primitive data types, I see symbol and I'm like, I've never used a symbol before. I've got no idea what that does. So did a bit of research, and this has actually got nothing to do with the talk, but I just think it's cool, so I'll chuck <laughs> it in there. Um, so symbol is used to make object properties that are anonymous. This data type is used as the key for an object property when the property is intended to be private or for internal use. So uh, if you want to have an object that gets... Um, that has a property that gets used internally and it actually doesn't get called by anything else in the rest of your code, you can use a symbol to create a unique and anonymous value. Cool, right? I think it's cool. I think coding's cool. All right, so why can't, why can't we just use vanilla JavaScript to, Im uh, to implement immu immutab uh, immutability? Would anyone like to stick up their hand and, and, make a, uh, and give it a shot? Because it's not part of the spec yet. Uh, what about uh, const? Still not actually immutable. Why is it not immutable? Because it's mutable. <laughs> <laughs> well, because that's not that's not completely correct. You const an object, can't you just mutate that object and yes. that'll be fine? You can uh, yes and no. So you got to be careful with this. You can mutate its properties. You cannot reassign. It's uh, it's an identifier. So we're going to go into that. Does anyone else have any, any ideas? Has anyone? Yes? So as in performance, is a concept. If you, if you use print JavaScript, you print in mutability. Yes, that is completely correct. Performance is an issue. Now, has anyone tried to implement immutability inside of their code? Yes, no, maybe? Has anyone actually used immutable JS before? There we go. You guys, you should be giving the talk. Good morning. Good morning. Feel free to grab a donut. Feel free to have a seat. Thank you. Okay. So, one way we can implement uh, immutability inside of JavaScript code bases is by uh, enforcing them by convention. And the convention is something that we all agree upon to do. And uh, even it gets a little bit tricky, but it's it's uh, somewhat possible. Even if we agree on a set standard for immutability, right? We have our little engineering meeting. We say, yeah, let's all do it together. The language itself has uh, limitations that uh, uh, make it uh, impossible to implement true immutability at, at, at every stage, yeah, which is why I'm giving a talk about immutable.js. So say, for instance, we go to our first uh, example, which is const. Um, so const stands for, again, stands for constant. It doesn't mean that the value it holds is immutable, right? Just that the variable identifier cannot be reassigned. So here it's const a, 
right? This is our variable identifier. Um, of, but, and, and this is the value that it holds, name's Ben. So this part is completely mutable. It just means that we can't make const a equals, you know, a tree. You know, it, it, it's, it, 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 we can't reassign that. We can change name, so we could change name to equal day or something like that, or even create a, the age is a 39 or whatever like that. Um, this uh, const will work uh, very well when, when working with a string. So if all we want to do is like const name equals Ben, you're fine. The problem that we run into is when we're working with an object or with an array. And this is an object a key value. So here we just have a, an example of that. So uh, if we try to reassign uh, just a number or if we a primitive data type, we're going to get hit with an error. Uh, but if we've got an object and we actually, um, or, or even an array, and we reassign a, a value of a property in, 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 in either of those, uh, then w it's going to work fine. So even though we're using const, doesn't uh, doesn't cut the, the mustard for immutability. Next, we've got uh, an, another technique called defensive copying, which is we used something that's called object assign, which basically makes a completely new copy of the object um, uh, and leaves the original uh, variable alone. Here's where we uh, deal with. Uh, what you brought up, which is defensive copying um, for very large state trees incurs a performance hit. There's also another thing that you can run into where you may accidentally copy something that shouldn't be copied. Uh, say, for instance, if you've got uh, cycles inside your uh, circular dependency cycles inside of your object um, uh, or something that actually references the window object. There's certain things you just don't want to copy. So you're not really sure kind of like what's going on inside of this thing that you're copying, you're just saying, let's just do a blast copy. So that's, uh, that's uh, really problematic. Next up we've got object.freeze. And what object.freeze does, does is it prevents um, uh, anything new from being added to an object, uh, anything from being removed, or anything from being modified inside. This sounds legitimately good. You know, if we use this together with a const, we're starting to get really close to mutability. Or not. The problem is that the object.freeze is shallow, which means if you have, uh, uh, if it has an object that contains like, other mutable objects, then those other things which are kind of like down, down a level uh, will still be mutable. So even things at the top level will be fine. Anything a level deeper is still mutable, we can still change it. Uh, the other issue is we can accidentally freeze things which really shouldn't be frozen. Say for instance, if some, for some reason we actually have uh, the window object, which is kind of like the containing object that contains the, the browser, or, or the, the top level of the browser, that we don't want to freeze that. But if uh, for some reason our object has a reference to that, we may accidentally freeze it, which would be bad. Feel really good. No one's even reached for a donut yet. Yes. Um, in object that assign, yes. um, does it? Oh, and also the spread operator. Does it do a full copy of all the nested data as well? Would anyone like to? Is it a deep copy? Yeah. No. Would anyone like to, to answer that? Both on the spread as well. Yeah. 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 yeah shell out. So even if you do a deep freeze, uh, which is recursively freezing everything down the chain, again, the problem with that is you may freeze things that you, you do not want to freeze. So uh, the conclusion that we draw from all of this is that um, uh, vanilla JavaScript is not completely suitable or performant to uh, implement immutability. So. Next, we're going to go into the uh, benefits of immutability. And I love XKCD. He's like a person who has absolutely no drawing ability, who's created uh, like almost a career out of drawing so, and being a software engineer. Um, can anyone, besides, um, good morning, um, uh, can anyone feel free to grab a donut? Um, 
Does anyone have an idea about a benefit that they've encountered uh, about implementing immutability? Um, but there's only one you're not allowed to use, which is it reduces errors and bugs in your code. I'm, not, I'm just not going to allow that one because it's just way too easy. Anyone? Yes. Uh, avoid re-rendering in React. Very cool. Another one? I actually don't know. I have that one in my list, so I'm going to try. I'm going to put that in later. Next. All right. So here are twelve. Uh, reasons that I found in my research of like so 12 different benefits of immu uh, Im uh, implementing immutability in your code. I'm going to add yours afterwards to make it lucky number 13. Is 13 lucky or unlucky? <laughs> Friday the 13th. So, I mean, the people who made the film, right, they feel lucky because they made a bucket of money from it. But anyway. um, so, just to kind of read through them, um, uh, and I'm only going to go into two this talk. Um, because if I went into all 12 or 13, um, I'd probably get fired. Um, so number one, uh, immutable objects are thread safe. They are simpler to construct, test and use. They avoid temporal coupling, scary term. We're going to actually go look at, look at that one. They avoid side effects, which we talk about a lot in functional programming. Um, they avoid identity mutability issues. They avoid invalid state, they increase predictability. Uh, here's the really contentious one that everyone debates on. They improve performance. And then the question becomes, well, what is performance? Um, is it uh, uh, the performance of the machine that we're working on? Or is it the performance of our team of developers? And Oracle is very opinionated on this. Um, they enable mutation tracking. So actually, uh, some you get uh, are that. Ah you get told when something is ch changes, um, or at least you can uh, very easily identify it. They provide failure atomicity, also another scary term. We're also gonna be talking about that one, that's number two. They're much easier to cache because you're not getting up with stale data um, that's in the cache. Um, do Australians say cache or cache? Uh, both. Cache. Got it, let's all argue about it. Cache. Give me the cache, anyway. Uh, and they prevent null references which are bad. Um, does anyone know why null references are really bad? So the, the guy who invented null, Tony Hoare, said it's, the, it's his billion dollar mistake because it's his greatest uh, uh, regret um, from developing programming languages which is creating null because it causes a lot of problems. So first, let's get into the first scary term. We're gonna we want to avoid temporal coupling. And temporal coupling occurs when two actions are bundled together into one module just because they happen to occur at the same time. Well, that sounds confusing. Imagine we have a request, and a request is something that we send to the server when we want to ask for some data or to perform some action. So we um, instantiate our, uh, a new request, and then we change its method to a post. And a post is when we want to create something new. Um, so for our first uh, call, we're going to uh, send it off. Now because we're kind of like in the same block of code, we now add a, a body onto it, and then we make a, a second uh, request, right? So this, it, this works. There's nothing wrong with this. But you have to remember as the programmer, right, that the first part needs to be configured before the second part, right? Otherwise, we don't have a method set. So this is kind of our configuration step here. And once you get to this part, you've just got to remember that this has to be done first. If for some reason this got commented out or didn't run, this code is now, uh, 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 it'll generate an error. This is, this is now a, a broken code. And, and this is the whole problem with, with temporal coupling, is that there's always this hidden piece of information that we as the programmer have to remember. We have to remember that this part here needs to get defined before we kind of do this stuff over here. All right? And this is, and again, it, it, here we can see again mutability, is that the request object is getting uh, uh, mutated in one place, and then another call later down the stack actually relies on that mutation. Right? So here's a, a place where mutability is really kind of uh, bitten us. If we were to make uh, the request object immutable, 
So first we're going to use a const, and then we're going to use object.freeze. And again, we're, we're just using native JavaScript stuff because we haven't jumped into immutable JS yet. Um, so uh, this now gets around our entire problem. We're not mutating the request anymore. Uh, it's, it's frozen. So we can send the first one, we can send the second one. Um, uh, there are no, the, the second one doesn't have to know about any changes that have occurred. Okay, second scary term is failure atomicity. So failure atomicity means that if, an, if a method throws an exception, the object um, uh, should, that, uh, that throws from should still be usable afterwards, right? That object should still have a valid state. Um, when we're using immutable objects, failure atomicity happens by default since the object state cannot be modified, right? So imagine we have, um, this is a little bit of a contrived example, uh, but we have a size and we've got some data. And every time we kind of loop over the data, we're going to decrement the, uh, the size. So it goes 3, 2, 1, 0, right? Now the issue is that this, this function that we are, are using here, the repeat, um, it does not accept values of zero or less. So if we keep incrementing this, uh, even though our, our loop says it's here, if we get to negative two, as soon as we hit zero, this is going to error out. And there's nothing wrong with an error, that's fine. The problem is that when we decrement size, it, because we're using a let, um, it, it stays decremented. So at the end of this test, size is going to be in an invalid state. So anything that it wants to use size afterwards is going to get an invalid uh, version of size. Uh, size. If we now rewrite this, I'm sorry it's a bit hard to read, but um, so we're going to rewrite this in a, uh, how do you say, in an immutable fashion, uh, where size is, if, as we kind of like loop through this, this is um, a recursive function. So as we kind of loop through this again and again, um, we'll still get the, the error. There's nothing wrong with errors. Errors tell us it's like pain in the body. It tells us there's something wrong. That's totally fine. But the state has not been modified. At the end of this, we hit the error. Size is still three. Uh, we have failure atomicity because the next thing that wants to use size is still in a valid, it's a, the, the state is still valid. Sorry. It is in a valid state. Something like that. Anyhow. So uh, this is a second uh, benefit of immutability. Now, there's this really, really smart guy, and he wrote this whole research article on the benefits of immutability. And I, uh, if you want to go to my <coughs> his um, uh, blog, uh, bit.ly slash, what, uh, strange spelling for immutable. Um, uh, but my, my blog, or my old blog, is called Cloud and Code. Just go look it up, and then you can read through all the different, the 12 different benefits of immutability, and it goes into depth into each one and why it's great, and it also has links to the source material and where all this came from. Mutability is cool, um, and reduces errors, and it reduces uh, development time. All right. So, we're going to jump into immutable.js. Does everyone kind of feel like they've got a decent understanding of mutability versus immutability and how it gets implemented in JavaScript? More or less? Yes. Unrelated request. Sure. Maybe you can move that stool and just like take one step back. We might be able to see the screen a bit better. It would be a pleasure. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. You got it. Let's move this guy over here. So besides that, everyone's hoopy. You good? It's rough doing this at 9.30 in the morning, isn't it? <laughs> it's just like the brain's like, I want coffee and donuts, nothing else. All right, so the first thing that people ask about uh, immutable JS is what about performance? Um, and I think it's a valid, it's a valid uh, uh, question. Um, so immutable.js has been uh, optimized to be even faster the native JavaScript uh, for um, for immutability techniques, uh, for instance, like uh, much faster than uh, like defensive copying and recursive freezing. So the first thing they went into because Facebook engineers, the first thing when they went into there it, to start on the project, they're like, you know, again, we can't create something that is non-performant. So what the the main difference between native JavaScript 
and immutable is that um, when you, instead of mutating an existing collection like an array or, a, or an object, um, immutable returns a new collection with the modifications you make. Right? So, say for instance, um, you've got a, again, like a, a, a list of numbers or an array of numbers, uh, and you want to add one on to the end. Instead of mutating that original array that you've got, it creates a new one and returns the new one to you. So, it doesn't uh, mutate the original one. Um, the other thing uh, where it has a similarity is it's designed to very closely mirror what we already know inside of JavaScript as per um, arrays, uh, objects, and sets. So installing Immutable, it's really simple. We just go to the good old NPM, and then we can require it um, if, if we're using it inside of Node. Uh, if you, uh, anyone wants to ever like just play around with it and have a really simple without setting up a whole new project and blah 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 I've got a little code snippet in here that you can just post post paste into your um, browser console uh, And that will make immutable Available to you in the console in your browser so you can mess around with it. So here this is these first four lines are just the um, Installation you may want to bump up the uh, version number to four point whatever it is now. Um, and then down here, you can see here, we're actually running an immutable, or we're creating an immutable list. So really easy to like start messing around with it. So just to, uh, there's uh, quite a few different collections inside of, inside of immutable. We've got lists, maps, ordered maps, sets, ordered sets, stacks, ranges, repeats, records, sets. Um, uh, it's, uh, we're gonna kind of get into a few of those uh, a bit more in depth, but just, kind of like to get rid of the fear of using it. Um, instantiating one and actually filling it with values is just pretty simple. I mean, it's just a one-liner. There's nothing, there's no um, black magic in there. So, sorry, quick question. Sure. <coughs> You'll probably get to this, but none of those involve nesting, uh, immutable covers nesting, right? Correct. Cool, that's fine. Sorry. But none of those involve Nest. We don't have nested objects in there. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we're going to walk through how to create nested objects. Okay. Immutable is uh, is built for deeply nested state trees. Um, but yeah. Uh, but yeah. Um, so firstly, uh, again, the geniuses at Facebook wanted to make our lives easier. So a lot of the methods that get run on, on these collections, uh, we, we kind of, uh, uh, how do you say, we, we know a lot of these uh, methods as far as um, so for instance for a list we've got push, pop, shift and unshift we know, we know these guys, we work with them all the time um, for maps we've got size, set, delete, keys and values and for sets we've got add, clear, delete and entries we know a lot of these methods we use them in our day to day so uh, for me especially with using a new library a big part of it is getting over the fear of uh, uh, you know, oh, something new, new documentation new stuff to learn uh, where I, one of the things I really like about Immutable is that that kind of step to to learning something new is 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 very very small. What about um, mm -hmm. reduce and map for each? Uh, those exist, and that's a great question. Mm -hmm. We're actually going to see that in a, a code snippet in, in a second. So, firstly, what's a list? A list is an ordered, indexed, uh, dense collection, very similar to an array. Um, a map is an unordered collection of key value pairs. Uh, the, one of the things with the map, uh, or the basic map, is the iteration order of it is undefined but stable. So if you kind of like loop through this several times, if you iterate over it several times, it'll be the same way each time. An ordered map is a map, um, but its iteration order is uh, the order in which they were uh, set. So here it would be A, B, C. The, the first one, just a regular map, it could be B, A, C, but it'll always be B, A, C. Yes? Um, <clears throat> given that you're passing in, this is a slightly esoteric thing, Different. you're passing in an object mm -hmm. to the ordered map. Yes. And the object is not inherently ordered, is it? Well, I don't know. Yeah, it depends how you write it. 
no, for instance, if, if you hmm? I, I see your point, <laughs> how do you is the how does, how does the ordered map know exactly what order if the object you passed in doesn't have an order to it? Yeah, it's just yeah, it gets hashed, right? Hmm. I'm sure there's a really good I'm answer, sure but it's probably a, a bit of a dive. So that's all right. Good, sorry. Uh, good question. Off track. Um, a set is a collection of unique values. So when you're iterating of a set, uh, the iteration order is undefined, but it's stable. So again, it's going to uh, if you do it the multiple iterations, you'll still have the same order. Order is undefined by but stable and order is defined. Okay, so say for instance um, for uh, a, a map, we, you don't know how it's going to, uh, what the order will be. It could be B, then A, then C if you're iterating over it, right? For uh, an ordered map, I believe, and I've got to test this out, it's going to be the, the, the order in which something was set. And what it could be is as well is if you actually um, if you run a set operation on this, it'll first iterate this, and then if you do a, a, a set, it'll iter uh, that'll that'll come up next. So yeah, I'm asking is yeah. how come we don't know um, what like in the unordered? Yeah, there is a specific implementation in Immutable JS mm -hmm. to. Um, iterate on an order. So how come we don't know the order? Like, is there some kind of logic behind it to for the so you JS mm -hmm. to decide how he he it, <laughs> it will um, um, iterate? Does it? Uh, do it differently because of performance or something? Yeah, yeah the only thing is that so you, can't, you, you can't rely on it. Mm. Um, like you, you, you will never know how the output is, whatever the library feels like. Are you asking like what's the reasoning time. behind having a difference between ordered and unordered? Mm. What? Or are you asking how can it be? It? I think I'm asking how come we don't know? Like what's the decision that's happening inside the code? that's gonna change the order between me setting it and it iterating on it? That's an excellent question, I've got no idea. Okay. <laughs> I, I, think, I think within an object, right, it creates a, like a, it, it, there's a hash ID reference to reference the different values within that object. And that's optimized between, with every like, key property that you put in, and it changes based on the key property that you put in. So, but 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 it does once it sets that it's the same thing every single time. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be B A C every single time. Yeah. Mm. Different different browser implementations will different definitely return keys in different order by default from a regular dictionary. So if it's using a regular a regular object, so if it's using mm. a regular object under the hood, it may be that they just don't compensate for um, implementation JavaScript tension differences. What I'm thinking, and I, and I haven't tested this, is that maybe in an ordered map. They actually say they almost give this an index. This, this is the, if there is an iteration, like let's say, for instance, like object dot keys, um, that it's going to go like one, two, three, and it'll be that way every time. Good morning. It's all right. You're fine. That looks tasty. Um, so that's actually something that would be interesting to test out. My kind of understanding of it was that you know, this would be first in the iteration, then this second, then this third. Whereas in another one, it could be any way around. Another way to kind of understand it is as well, if you actually call set on it um, and actually added something else, it would be first this one, then, then the next one. But it'd be really interesting to, to test out. Um, so we've gone over set. Uh, we have an ordered set, which is again, we kind of, you're, you're seeing that, that same um, pattern uh, that, that will go through uh, the different collections. So it's a type of set that has the additional guarantee that the iteration of uh, order of values will be the order in which they were added. So here it's the A, B, C, D, instead of, you know, B, A, 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 A yeah, or whatever. I'm sure that's so a valid it's a, set. A, B, C, A. Oh, the, the reason this, I, I put this in is because, um, so you've got A, B, C, A. Because it's a collection of unique values, that second A is going to get cancelled out, right? So it's going to delete any or, or reduce, if you want, any um, duplicate values. So it's pretty cool. 
Um, stacks are index collections which, which support a very, very efficient um, additional or re removal from the front using uh, unshift and shift. So they, they're particularly optimized for that, but for all intensive purposes in array. Um, a sec is, uh, it describes a lazy operation which allows them uh, to basically chain different methods inside uh, without creating intermediate collections. So say for instance you have uh, your array, we'll call it, or, or a list, however you want to call it, and then you want to like uh, run a filter and a map on it, and here's, uh, Darren, your question is, uh, so if you, here you can see that filter and map are uh, valid uh, methods on, on a sec. Um, so between, you'd expect it to create like a new collection for this one and then a new collection for this one. And this is one of the ways that performance becomes an issue. So SEC uh, deals with that by, uh, you know, keeping one in, in memory, hitting that, and then, um, uh, how do you say, not creating multiple collections which would incur performance cost. So this is, this is one way to get a performance boost out of your code if you have multiple um, things to do. So do you have to create a, a, a sec or sequence to filter a map, or is those methods found on arrays? They're found on everything. They're found on, but that's just more, a more efficient way of doing it. Um, more efficient, I mean, if you want to run methods, uh, certain methods on it, yeah. um, it's a very efficient way of, of doing that. If you've got multiple things you actually want to do, uh, really consider using a sec. Um, a range, uh, I think anyone who does Python already knows what a range is. Um, so it's basically an a, a index sequence of uh, a numbers from a start to end with a step involved. Um, so here we start at 10, we end at 30, and the step is 5, so it'll be 10, 15, 20, 25. And a repeat um, just repeats a, a value X amount of times. Um, a record is very similar to a JavaScript object, uh, but it enforces a specific uh, set of allowed uh, keys and it has default values. So if you actually go in and delete one of the uh, uh, keys, uh, it'll repopulate with the original default value. Pretty cool. Um, it's similar to a name tuple. By the default, yes. Uh, I have a question about the set. Sure. Uh, how does immutable.js recognize uh, duplicates? Is it just the same way as JavaScript.js does it? You'd have to look under the hood. I've so got it no do, idea uh, how. It does comparison of, the, of massive objects. Like Inside the set, there's an answer over there in the back. Um, immutable objects in JavaScript. Right, it's, it's a value, so basically two things inside of, uh, two immutable objects, two objects inside of immutable JS are considered equal if their value is equal. It doesn't look for that they have the same um, address in memory. Okay, so if I, I create two different objects, but they have the same value, like immutable objects. They are considered equal. if I equal. them in a set, then they are equal, okay. Yeah, good question. Um, so here we have like two uh, list and map methods, um, set in and delete in. So set in is going to return a new list, and again, that's like always got to be your thought with working with immutable, is it just always returns something new. That's how it avoids um, mutating the original object. So it returns a new list um, having a set value at, at, at that specific key part. Um, and if that doesn't, if if there's no nothing. Um, if not, nothing exists to that key path, it's going to go and it could create a new um, uh, object there. Uh, and then delete in will return a new list uh, having removed the value at that key path. And if nothing exists to that key path, then no, no change will occur. Um, update in, you get the general same idea. Uh, merge, merge is very similar to object.assign. So it just kind of mushes together uh, the two objects or merges together the two, two different objects. Um, and then uh, if the two keys are duplicated, then the, the, la the later, latter one are, um, the latter, well, latter ones are used. Uh, this does not work with uh, nested, so this is shallow, uh, but you can do, you've got a, a merged deep 
if you want to uh, deal with uh, deeper state trees. So some cool stuff about immutable JS. So firstly, uh, and again, they try and like reduce the low of the bar as much as possible for us to understand. Um, so you can use a raw JavaScript objects and arrays. So anywhere that um, uh, you can use a, a plain a JavaScript array or object anywhere that a method expects a collection. So uh, yeah, uh, you can also. Uh, can, so that, that's uh, JavaScript to immutable. You can also do the opposite, immutable to JavaScript. It's really easy. Um, you can copy, you can do things shallowly with two array and two object, or you can do, deep, do it deeply with uh, two JS. Um, and then all, imp uh, all collections also have a two JSON uh, method on them, which means you can pass something to JSON stringify directly. Um, all immutable collections are uh, iterable, uh, which allows them to be used anywhere an iterable is expected. So you can use a spread operator uh, inside of an array uh, on an immutable uh, collection. So you can, you, you can use it together with uh, ES2015 or ES6, um, cool stuff like spread operators and destructuring and everything like that. Like, like that. Um, so immutable collections are intended uh, to be uh, nested and nestable um, and the methods like merge d get in and set in and update in they are like built to help you work with deeply nested um, data structures uh, we've kind of already gone over this slide which is the, the uh, immutable objects are equal when their values are equal not, uh, it doesn't mean that they point to the same place in memory because by design they have different places in memory. Uh, but the, uh, again, if you don't, uh, so again, using the triple equals uh, operator, yes, uh, well, one, one sec and I'll get to it. Um, so using the triple equals operator is, is not going to work. Uh, we do have uh, two methods, equals and is, um, which look at um, uh, value equality. Your question. Um, for example, if the value of a, like for both maps, would be an object, object, mm -hmm. a plain JavaScript object, yep. then equals would fail, because like the values are actually not not the same because they're plain JavaScript objects. Mm. Do you think that equals would fail in this case? Because, I like, believe so. I mean, that's the reason that you've got an equals method to me because one's going to come out it, when you actually look at it, what comes out of that. Um, it, like say for instance, if you actually did a console log on one of the on map one or map two, it, it doesn't actually come out as a a JavaScript array. It comes out as an immutable object. Yeah. But what I mean is, if the maps contain um, non-primitive JavaScript objects. So, sorry, can you just go back on screen? I just I think I know what you're asking. So basically, you're saying if you had two from JSs here, for example. Yeah. And then did a nested dot equals nested one, would they be equal? Is that kind of what you mean? Um, no, if okay. you go one slide I further. didn't know what you meant. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thanks anyway. Um, if, <coughs> if the maps would contain, like the values of both A's would be two different plain JavaScript objects. So JavaScript objects which wouldn't be considered as equal from vanilla JS point of view. Mm -hmm. With equals, then, like I, I get that equals compares other immutable nested objects. Yeah. The value of nested immutable. objects. You can't have non immutable nested in immutable. It's immutable all the way down. Oh, okay. Yeah, so even if you put them there, they would be transpiled into or converted to immutable. Okay. So, so does this, you can't use the equals at all in immutable. With other immutable objects, you can. With other, I'm saying like you, you can't use the double equals sign. It's a different thing. Yeah. Use it for the same reason. Is this yeah. the same memory location as the thing that I've got? Yeah. It's the same thing as what I've always meant. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I believe I believe that a double equals would actually work between like map one and map two, but I'd have to try. This is a triple equals, which means it's yeah. So I'd have to look at that. You'd want to test it out. Yeah. So triple equals would be false. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. Triple equals is false. So here it's a not equals equals. Double, double equals, equals would not show. Double equals would still be false because it, it just coerces primitives. 
Yeah, Nick is, yeah, you're right. It's, it's, got, it's got a conversion step involved in it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, best to play around with that one. Yes? Yeah. If the map, if the map is very, very big, for example, by some reason, the map is very big and can have a lot of <coughs> one million array, and sorry, just a, a single array is very big. Mm -hmm. sorry. Is that mean that the equal to what well, US know if the, if the two objects, how they compare, how entirely how they come together? How does dot equals work? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, to be, I, I'm just being absolutely, the internal workings of the equals method, I'm not sure. I mean, but what I understand from it, from my reading, is that it checks a uh, value or quality. So, it, like I said before, it kind of doesn't look point to the same place in memory as long as the um, uh, contents, or the, val the values are, are, are similar or equal, uh, then, then it's true. I don't know exactly the algorithm that they use to kind of loop go, you know, uh, recursively go down the state tree. That would be super interesting to read though. If we order in, just to compare everyone. Does, I can kind of answer sure. that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So the difference between is and equals is the identity check. So if an object <coughs> is another object, it checks the ID of that object, and it means that every sub tree is also equal. So that it does a primary check up front to say, is this object the same object? Uh, and then it can be said that everything below is, and then following that it does a value check all the way down until it hits an equal identity and oh, stops traversing that tree. Thank you. Um, batching mutations, this is pretty cool. Um, so performing a mutation that creates a, uh, creates and returns a new collection. So basically, if you want to do several mutations, um, it, it, it incurs a penalty cost. Um, so say for instance here, we're doing a, a we create our list, um, uh, and we, we, we do a, a, a several pushes, just to get the general idea of, of making several different uh, changes. Because it's inside of this uh, with mutations function, um, uh, what it does is that it uh, basically, it's kind of like almost like similar to sec is that it doesn't create um, uh, multiple collections. So it basically creates a temporarily uh, mutable uh, copy of the collection and then applies a batch of mutations in a performant manner. So if you've got a ton of mutations or several mutations that are, you think will be costly, uh, you can use uh, batch mutations to increase the performance. I see a lot of confused faces. Any any questions there? It might just ask that we hold questions to the end because oh, we've yeah. gone quite a bit of it. Oh, all right. Uh, last slide, I think. So you can use set, push, and pop with uh, with, with, muta with mutations, but other methods like map filter, sort, and splice uh, uh, will create new collections, so don't use them. And <laughs> da -da 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 -da. Ah. Any questions? In which case would you say don't use immutable JS or immutable um, I feel that, uh, just get my personal opinion, and I believe everyone's differs. My personal opinion is don't, uh, I wouldn't use it in hacky personal projects that I'm just prototyping, just, and I'm going to throw it away. So any, for me, any project that I don't want to be working on in like two or three weeks, I wouldn't use immutable on. Does this come under like, uh, like the larger topic of whether you should use like, um, what's it called again? Like, um, TypeScript? Functional programming? No, like functional programming. Yeah, functional versus like class-based and the pros Im and cons. Of, Immutability yeah. is a big topic inside of functional programming. Yeah. Um, the answer is yes to me, but I'm sure that will be a great topic for discussion. I, I guess well, going down this functional programming route, I also often find that I'm going to have to pass in a lot of parameters into my function to kind of deal with state within the function itself. So without being condescending at all, I'd yeah. say that that is a code smell. And if you've got like 20 different parameters that are going into a function, then you really want to think about the design of your product, your, your, of what you're doing, and maybe if there's a way that you can. But I, I'm actually, I think there's another talk in functional programming that's coming later on. I might leave it for that one. Before. Oh, before. <laughs> maybe before I started here. 
Um, but I, I think it's an interesting discussion. I think that they, that's a code smell and your design needs to be looked at. Any other questions? Thank you all, you're a fantastic audience. No one heckled me. Thank you.